First of all, a technical, okay. uh, a technical question, Danny. Uh, can I share my screen or do you have to allow me to do that? Or would it be all right if I share the screen now? Sorry. Yep, um, if you can hear me, I've allowed that just now. Okay, uh, one second. It's ch changing from Teams to, to Zoom sometimes. Uh, I got, is it? Uh, Mm. Well, I cannot. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Now you should be seeing that. Okay. Great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, thank you to Stuart and to Danny to invite me to this uh, session. It's uh, great to have the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you. And maybe get some feedback, maybe get some ideas, I don't know, maybe future opportunities, who knows. So um, today I'm going to talk about uh, my own experience, and I call the session Designing Narrative uh, Based Digital Experiences. Um, yes, would like to introduce myself. I uh, teach uh, uh, digital media at the University of Hull. Uh, currently uh, transitioning to University of Salford starting next month. Um, I'm going to be still a, a lecturer in digital media, so probably would be a very similar uh, profile in terms of teaching. Today, what I'm going to do is to talk about, uh, yes, briefly introduce this, uh, my multidisciplinary background, what, what I've done in the past a little. Uh, I'm going to talk about narrative in design in order to uh, uh, put everybody on the same page in what uh, narrative is and how narrative can enrich uh, digital design products, okay? And then I, I'm going to talk about a specific uh, example, a project uh, I'm still really finishing, but uh, which have uh, produced already some outcomes. So I think it could be interesting to see real practice and uh, real problems. You know? uh, so I hope uh, you, uh, you enjoy this uh, uh, as much as I do preparing this. So first of all, in relation to what I uh, done in the past, uh, what's my uh, background? I study psychology, I have a master's in psychology and a bachelor's degree. I did also a master's in advertising and I've been working ma mainly as motion graphic designer. So basically uh, this kind of animation that is constructed in combination with graphic designers and trying always to communicate, uh, you know, ideas using uh, visual language and animation. Uh, when I did my PhD, I moved slightly to media studies, uh, doing a PhD in cultural studies and narrative. And uh, since then, my research has been in uh, areas such as storytelling, fictionality, uh, and uh, game studies, and so on. So this right now is what I, what I do mainly, apart from teaching uh, modules such as multi-platform storytelling, all digital storytelling at the university. If I have to define my... Uh, mm, research uh, with a sentence I would say, and this is only again just to introduce myself, uh, I work on narrative, trying to find what narrative makes uh, the products to be uh, enjoyable, engaging, uh, and more appealing to different uh, transcultural backgrounds. So uh, in doing so, I've been publishing extensively on Japanese animation in anime, but also in other topics related to uh, digital media in general and fictionality uh, in particular, okay, fictional products. So uh, some of these examples uh, can be in my profile, but again, this is not really to talk about myself, just to introduce myself. So in the last years, I've been working uh, more on uh, practical research trying to collaborate with other projects, with other researchers within my institution and all the institutions in order to uh, apply digital media to their own products, uh, to their own projects. So it is very interesting because uh, for a moment it's, it's also refreshing 
to adopt uh, other points of views and uh, you know uh, just share the, the perspective of other researchers in terms of uh, problems that can be uh, sometimes uh, socially or um, academically uh, with high impact we can have a, it can have a high impact in terms of social or academic uh, research and uh, these are all kinds of stuff no i've been uh, working uh, in digital heritage i've been uh, working in education and i've been working uh, more recently in immersive video for a prototype with the uh, british olympic team um, as motion graphics uh, designer as well and uh, which is not really that much research but still uh, associated to some research projects and more recently this project uh, which i'm going to comment that has to do with the design of virtual reality applications so in order to talk about this project i would like to do a little reflection in terms of uh, these theoretical terms and I know some of you, for what uh, Danny and Stuart uh, have told me, are working in, uh, uh, well, uh, studying uh, serious games and all this. So I'm sure that you will be more than familiar with some terms like, uh, you know, interactivity, engagement, all this kind of stuff. Uh, my approach to this is mainly through design. And I'm going to uh, describe what I understand uh, uh, about uh, designing narrative artifacts okay so the first uh, reflection I would like to say is uh, all these objects have something in common and this thing that have in common is basically they are products of design uh, we design all these and we design them to be experienced we design them to be used and therefore and this is a, a common aspect of uh, in the um, in all kinds of uh, design approaches we tend to think uh, we design products but actually we design experiences we try to design uh, to be as prescriptive as we can uh, in terms of creating uh, evoking emotions and experiences on users but this is only something we are intended to it's a plan it's a strategy sometimes uh, the experience of the user might not have anything to do with what we have expected to to them uh, to experience and that is why we say designing for user experience and not designing user experience we cannot really control what is going to be the answer of the of the user it's something this is a, a kind of you know paradigmatic uh, uh, approach in in experiences uh, Kind of, kind of common to start with this. Uh, design is always similar to a, a research approach in, in the sense that we are creating uh, different uh, products that have to be tested. And also these products are the answer to a previously well-defined problem. So uh, we are uh, in processes that are uh, also iterative we create uh, different uh, solutions but then the solutions have to be test and then those tests might imply changes in the prototype or even in the uh, previous uh, problem definition so that is the kind of uh, environment we really work in and some people would say this has very little to do with this uh, with designing narrative experiences narrative is not something we can design as we design uh, uh, other elements of, uh, of experience like for example websites or uh, applications or um, you know uh, graphic design for example and that is not exactly the truth I mean the, if you would take the approach of uh, use design and producer experience we need to just understand how the process of interacting with narratives is different uh, to the process of interacting with other kind of products and understanding that we can really uh, design user experiences for narrative purposes and we can also test them okay but i would like just to uh, make a little comment about this why narrative why uh, working on storytelling 
I have to say that a story is usually uh, addressed because it's an effective way of communicating ideas, uh, increasing memorability, increases, increasing learnability using just cognitive terms. Uh, a story is also universal because uh, a story is based on emotions and in that sense, emotions are universal. So if emotions can be understood in a universal way, uh, then uh, stories are a good way to communicate between people of different uh, cultural backgrounds. And that makes uh, uh, very powerful, the power, uh, very powerful, very useful, the use of stories. It's important to understand that not everything is a story when uh, we uh, design digital products, okay? Uh, a story uh, requires certain definition, but it's true that the story at the same time can be lax in its definition. You have the opportunity to define the experience as part of a larger story, and therefore uh, existing uh, elements of intertextuality between the text of the interaction, when you understand the interaction as a text, the, the product, and uh, the whole experience, okay? Or you can understand that your experience, uh, the experience of the user uh, working with this tool is a story, okay? The, the user experience the story, is uh, listening to the story the same way uh, is watching a movie or reading a novel, or any other uh, fictional media uh, interacts with us. Your experience can be connected to multiple stories. Okay, it's important to create, uh, or oh, there is some tendency in create the stories that can be part of a larger story uh, canvas. And uh, that is obviously what it relates to uh, the whole paradigm we are in terms of uh, mediatic convergence, but also narrative convergence, no? all these elements of transmedia storytelling and things like that. A story uh, can be uh, a niche where it comes specifically more interesting for uh, uh, the cognitive approach to the storytelling is that storytelling can be the, or can be reduced to the experience of the user, to what it happens in, in the user's mind. So therefore a story can be uh, also embedded in elements of space or character design, okay? Uh, storytelling is not only the text itself, it's also uh, uh, the image, the, the logic that creates in the user in relation to that elements of uh, fictionality that then uh, comes part of a bigger canvas, which is the story, but it's a cognitive uh, story to a cognitive level, okay? So, uh, it's important for me to dis differentiate uh, narrative from other forms of communication. Not all forms of communications are narrative. It's important. Uh, this one of these uh, authors uh, uh, commented that if everything is narrative, then nothing is narrative. We, we cannot extend the label of narrative to every product that we do that deal with emotions or deal with uh, you know, characters or things like that we need to establish as uh, elements that define what a story is if we really want to uh, test the efficiency of adopting this strategy as a way of communicating. So uh, different, uh, different approaches, okay? Some of them based on the definition of fictionality versus reality, or, or some of them uh, focus on the act of narration in the enunciation that is called in narrative studies okay it needs to be communicated to someone else for my students i usually sorry i'm going to close this uh, for my students in undergraduates i usually tend to use a very simple definition of what it is narrative for me, narrative is when someone wants something, but there are obstacles on the way. It's so simple, but at the same time, this implies so much, because what is the definition of each individual terms? Who is someone? Is it the user? Is it the avatar? Is it the voice? Is it the, the perspective? 
I mean, and obviously uh, we have here a lot to discuss. Something, yeah, there are elements of achievement, there are milestones, there are turning points. So this is going to relate to a structure, okay? But basically, uh, there must be an object that defines the whole narrative program, okay? And again, uh, maybe my approach is very structural, uh, obviously, but, but uh, you know where I, uh, where I am uh, uh, for, no? Yes, trying to define this. There will be obstacles, but again, obstacles can be many things. It could be all the people, it could be, uh, you know, enemies, it could be puzzles, it could be many things, okay? But there will be a resistance, there will be a, a challenge, okay? So this is what I tend to, uh, to tell the students when they want to create narrative experiences. Requirements from that point are lax, okay? But still they are. Uh, we can uh, talk, for example, about the... Uh, uh, why? Still showing up. Uh, anyway, uh, requirements, character, for example. What kind of character? Well, here I, I just comment some of the uh, main um, uh, tools when creating stories, the differentiation between different levels of depth into the characters in relation to, uh, well, the definition uh, but also the complexity and also basically is, the, is, their, is their function in the narrative, okay? Are they expressing motivations? Are they expressing, uh, you know, uh, moral concerns? Are they experiencing change through the narrations? Well, we are probably in the case of main characters, characters that are described to this maximum level of depth and they are therefore using the terminology uh, this terminology, just 3D characters, okay? Uh, versus all the kind of more flat characters where sometimes uh, you can use even the, the template of a stereotype or a cliche, but you have uh, characters that are well-defined, well-identified. They are very easy to understand, but you probably don't need to uh, get uh, deeper into their motivations or whatever, but they have opinions and they have sometimes a space to be explored maybe in other experiences or wherever. I'm just thinking in, in great secondary characters from our favorite fictional stories and how sometimes that creates uh, other stories you know, in the paradigm that we are of st transmedia storytelling. You know? And then, you know, the most simple characters, pure attrezzo, if you want, okay. Motivations of the character implies set goals. Okay, set the pace when those goals are going to be achieved, when they are going to be milestones, well, uh, is the function of them in the whole structure. Okay, and then translating the logic of creating uh, a structured storytelling to the logic of media production and uh, the logic of, uh, for example, game design. Know how that relates to game design in terms to create variables, to create uh, functions, to create, uh, you know, um, game engines, for example, in the most sophisticated uh, form uh, of all this, uh, when you create your own uh, engine. And you have seen that I've been talking about the structure. Remember that uh, what I try to describe is a very, uh, cognitive-based uh, approach to the narrative. Therefore, a structure is going to be uh, reproduced in the mind of the user. The important th thing here is not only that our structures follow, for example, and this is the typical uh, three acts structure, and this is obviously a structure that has been used uh, since Aristotle, so it doesn't uh, look as that updated if you think about that. Uh, this is a whole, of course, a whole, uh, a whole uh, topic to talk uh, any other day. Is uh, are all the stories following uh, classical structures? From my point of view, it's not that important. The important thing is that the most uh, relevant emotional dynamics of the structure are going to be experienced 
when we are uh, on a reticular narrative, on a narrative that is based on a network, or a narrative that is uh, pure uh, branching narrative, like in this, like in this case. Okay, if we are doing a video game, for example, we'll be uh, facing the challenge of creating experiences that are emulating uh, a classical narrative. But they are not na classical narratives because they are benefited of uh, the randomness, the complexity, the personalization of what it is to work with uh, digital narratives. But the challenge is to make users experience the levels of engagement and uh, uh, emotional pleasure, you know, that you have uh, in relation to the main milestones within the narrative. So that is what we have to pay attention in relation to our structure, okay? Or our experience map, if we work with experience map, okay? As always, we are in the paradigm of the game design where uh, video games are usually uh, always uh, dealing with uh, a confrontation between what can be represented, what can be experienced as a story, and what can be uh, manipulated, what can be, uh, mm, uh, you know, pure address to the play, the pure play. I mean, in between those extremes, we have been in game studies for 30 years of debate. Right now, uh, that doesn't exist anymore, that radical ludologist. Uh, narrative uh, games uh, are defined more in terms of a genre than more than in terms of a mode of play, because uh, we understand that there are ways of playing uh, that are uh, pure narrative, okay? So we can talk about that later anyway. I would like to, uh, to try to use this this vocabulary, these uh, uh, concepts I used uh, in relation to this case study, which has been this application I've been developing uh, more recently and I still still in process, but with some outcomes uh, so far that I think we can uh, comment and and perhaps you can find them uh, useful in order to inspire your own experiences in the future. So first of all, problem definition, I would just to comment, this is a project with a European funding. Uh, it's a really, really huge project. I wouldn't say this is a problem definition in terms that not everybody would think, oh, having a lot of money to spend usually is not a problem. Yes, it's not. The problem is to decide in what to spend the money. And uh, these uh, researchers from the University of Murcia, my hometown in Spain, which I managed to meet, uh, uh, personally commented that they were interested to explore the use of digital tools to, uh, to communicate the outcomes of this big project. And they have already assigned a project uh, budget for this. So they wanted to create a kind of product. Originally, they wanted a website. And, uh, and they wanted a digital brochure or something like that, just kind of uh, explaining this is what we have achieved. But this is where I, where I come and I suggested to create something more, uh, more kind of uh, original in the sense of uh, addressing, for example, new technologies or technologies that were in a moment right now of more, uh, you know, uh, trendy, uh, if you want, uh, like virtual reality, especially a couple of years before, there was, you know, some interest in terms of research and on that, but it has been, you know, as you know, for a while. And um, so the, the challenge here would be what to do in terms of using that kind of tools uh, to, uh, uh, to promote the project. This project, uh, it's uh, kind of wide. Uh, it's uh, involving uh, uh, in researchers from four, from four different countries. Uh, they work specifically on the European uh, agriculture of the Mediterranean. And uh, you might be aware, these are very dry lands. Very, uh, um, it, the weather is kind of dry and uh, very warm. And um, the approach to these projects, uh, interestingly, and this is one of the 
the nice things of work with other researchers. Uh, you learn things that you never uh, thought you were going to learn about. And these kind of projects are adopted from a very holistic approach. So uh, you have the, the idea that this is not really about climate change. This is not only about uh, avoiding uh, lands to be more dry and more, uh, you know, um, uh, difficult to, to produce or less efficiency, but how that deals with everything, deals with climate change, like, uh, for example, the levels of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, or, uh, you know, uh, also affects the economy, the development of the area and the population, and how they can manage to evolve in terms of social and economic terms. So uh, we are talking about uh, also about the diversity, how certain kinds of cultures can be uh, more compatible with the development of the diversity, biodiversity in terms of, you know, small animals, insects, uh, birds, things like that, all kinds of uh, ecosystems. So therefore, when you, uh, when you are addressing this, you need to understand all that documentation and you need to have several meetings with the researchers in order to create languages and terminologies that relates their, their experience and their vision of the world with the experience and the vision of the world of the target users. And therefore, of course, defining the target user, which is very important as you can imagine in any design task. So what is the target user? In this case are the farmers of these areas professionals that are not necessarily very aware of the consequences to the climate change or the biodiversity or even the economy of some of the actions that they, uh, they employ when, uh, you know, working on their, uh, well, while working on their farmlands, okay? So uh, there are at least five directories. I'm going to just mention them. Ecosystem, ecosystem Systemic services, which is one of these concepts, how these, uh, all these areas benefit society. Circular economy, uh, which uh, has to do with the, um, uh, with the sustainability of the different actions, with the recycle, uh, recycling of residues, all these different actions. The mitigation of climate change, okay, understanding climate change as a truth, as a a real fact and of course what kind of actions we do in relation to uh, mitigate the consequences of this okay the adaptation based on ecosystems which is the coexistence of the human uh, species with other species in, in in their impact to the to the environment okay and finally adapting to climate change which is different from mitigating okay because it has to do more with uh, how to protect uh, our uh, lands and our products of the consequences of the climate change. Okay, so you have all that collection of terms and how you're going to translate that into a digital application using narrative. It's, it has been really a challenge, I'm not going to, 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 to lie. The, the first thing uh, has to do with uh, conceptualizing uh, this is, a, for example, a little prototype we did uh, using at that time Unreal. In certain moments, we moved to Unity. So defining the tools to work, to communicate among the different members of the team, uh, it's basic. So basic, the first, uh, and I'm not putting the typical chronogram here because one of the realities of these projects, especially when you are uh, employing students and, and you have also to do other things in research and teaching and all this is that unfortunately the uh, there is some dilatation some uh, uh, some delays uh, on the production process so it is not very realistic sometimes to create chronograms although of course you create them because uh, you want to, to create some expectations and, and, and move the project forward but sometimes Honestly, you never uh, achieve to, to accomplish those chronograms. So that is why I didn't put them here. But uh, yeah, taking all these kind of decisions, calculating the budget in relation to uh, the cost 
of the materials and the time of the team, which is obviously the most important. And everything has to be translated to a language and to, uh, uh, um, if you want, some kind of narrative as well for the researchers to be involved in this and to be, uh, you know, satisfied with the uh, way we uh, create solutions for the problem. Okay, so in this, the, uh, I have to say that from all the team, probably the communication with the researchers is the most important because they are the clients, but also because they have uh, a very valuable knowledge that you would never have, uh, you, you are not going ever to be able to achieve. So you need to, to make sure that they can translate that knowledge into something you can understand and use to create a, a good product. Okay, so this is uh, basically what I would like to, to tell in terms of media production. When we move to the narrative design, and this is more related to the concepts I worked before, it was the definition of different uh, alternatives, different solutions, and expecting, uh, you know, to get the support of the researchers. And sometimes uh, you, you're surprised that the researcher might be more creative, more flexible than you would expect. And they are really providing much more creative solutions than you would expect from, from the researcher. Sometimes you are more conservative than them. And it's, it's something very interesting. So uh, we decided to create a, a spatial setting that is based on a real space. Uh, basically, uh, you remember this uh, slide, uh, this area of Spain, uh, going to move this, okay. uh, this uh, southeast of Spain, is uh, Murcia, the region of Murcia. So these are uh, real spaces with real uh, vegetation, animals, uh, light, if you want. It's a real space, okay? Uh, the time settings, and this is where the narrative design uh, uh, begins. I suggested to create a time setting in the future, to create a narrative that the actions of the users might have consequences in the future to the landscapes. So we have uh, then later the definition of the character, which I created a character that is you know, implicitly similar to the target user, farmer. And then uh, in terms of genre, I try to use conventions from the different genres, but kind of a simulation game, okay? By simplifying, obviously, these elements uh, to the logic and to the uh, requirements of this tool. So world building, in my uh, particular case, is going to raise from the complexity, okay? the idea that the variables that are manipulated are going to really affect the landscape and then uh, the cohesion, okay? Some kind of logic, some kind of, uh, this logic is, is based on research, which is very interesting. Here, uh, the, the actions have been uh, weighed and have been tested to match the, uh, the knowledge we have of uh, the pilot studies that have been done in the past in these real spaces. So actually we are talking about real data, data that is transformed into uh, artifacts. Okay? So then the gamification is uh, basically a very simple experience. I, I will uh, show it to you now, based in four uh, terms uh, where you are evolving in time and you can select four choices between different uh, possibilities. Okay? Uh, in terms of the design alternatives, and remember we talked before about this is an iterative design. So we have many different things that are going to be evolving and are hoping to be tested and have to be, you know, altered through the process, uh, following uh, the commitments of, you know, the contracts and the, and the initial uh, pitch of the project, of course. But we have elements of level design, uh, using uh, maps, uh, technologies of satellite maps, uh, accessing the, these technologies uh, depends, of course, of the country, but in the case of, country, of Spain, 
they are managed by the government and they are available for the user so you can create your own high maps that are based on these uh, real scenarios and then later level designers are going to be uh, adapting those to uh, a game uh, logic and uh, a more game feeling and uh, we have also the defining of the variables that are in this case inspired in the different elements we have commented before some of them are direct consequences some of them are indirect consequences so you have to think that the variables when we talk about game designs are everywhere not only the variables that have a narrative meaning but also the variables that are just part of the functions of the game like for example having or not having clicked this button can be uh, depending on the on the design can be rendered as a, as a variable as, as well okay so different prototypes were constructed we work for example with excel uh, and visual basic to simulate the value of some variables we work with unity and then uh, we were testing this with the researchers once and once and once again As uh, you have seen, uh, it's only the, the integration of different uh, elements. No? This is digital design. How we uh, transform uh, the information into something appealing, recognizable, uh, easy to memorize, uh, fast. You know? Obviously, we are now dealing with elements of user experience and user interface and with elements of informational design. So, for example, these icons uh, were uh, the way we translated concepts like adaptation based in ecosystems or mitigation of the climate change. Okay, all these different uh, big concepts were translated into icons. Okay, in order to communicate to the user that they have had a great uh, effect on the on the uh, you know on the narrative on the results of that story. The result of this, uh, as commented, has been recently uh, developed. Right now, you can play on the website. Uh, so I will show you how uh, it goes. I hope. Uh, okay, let's see. You have Mac. I don't know for what reason. It seems to work better on Mac, on Safari, in case you're interested in, in playing this. Um, but uh, yeah, I can imagine that because uh, so far my tests on iOS and Android have been working better. So I can imagine that the application would work better for your mobiles than in websites. Okay. So, uh, well, I just uh, put it to load. Let's see if I can show you. But in the meantime, this is just video of the gameplay. So you can see some of the possibilities, but obviously uh, five languages, and this is a, a European requirement for the projects. And the experience basically reproduce this landscape. And you can imagine there in the crops, uh, the uh, cultives, which are olives and, and almonds can grow. And then you have, uh, uh, you know, a space for the residues, uh, space for the animals, other variables are uh, random, like the presence of the rain, uh, the sky maps, and all this. Uh, so depending on the turn and the selection of the choices, you can have uh, the population of different uh, artifacts, and different objects in the scene. Uh, I've just seen that it has been low now. So here you can, uh, you can see the, the game. Uh, you have also, oh, sorry, I'm going to take out the sound, uh, the instructions here, which this is where the, the application deals more with uh, digital brochures, communicating some elements of the, of, the, of the project, and also trying to explain the icons, effects, okay? And then, uh, well, you can select different languages, and, and then in this case, you can only play in touch mode, uh, but obviously in the, in the um, Android and iOS version, you can play uh, using a cardboard. 
uh, which makes uh, the experience different, obviously. So uh, this is uh, the result of the project. Oops. And uh, hopefully more or less clear the highlights of this um, presentation in relation to how narrative design can uh, help us to create, uh, you know, uh, more effective uh, digital uh, experiences. In total, honestly, we have to see because this is very recent, we have to test that, but I'm very confident that there will be a, a good, uh, uh, you know, reception of this. It will be some involvement of different uh, groups in education and within the research uh, area of this uh, environmentalism. Uh, I think precisely tomorrow is the International Day of the Soil. So we have a big action there. Uh, we are going to uh, promote this uh, tool uh, through the internet, the Android and the iOS market. So hopefully uh, uh, it, will be, it will have a good, uh, a good reception, let's see. Thank you very much for your attention. If anybody wants to comment, have time still to talk about this. And uh, also happy to talk any other moment in the future, you know, in relation to these sort of the projects or anything that we are working in that moment. But uh, it has been really a pleasure to be here anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was uh really really uh interesting um i actually had a question for you so um i am just starting my phd so my phd is looking at using um immersive technologies to uh reanimate or recontextualize ethnographic artifacts within museum collections so a lot of it's really looking at what the cultural meaning is and the social value behind the objects and how you can tell that using storytelling and narrative uh, through immersive technology specifically so i was really interested um what you talked about right at the beginning of your presentation around um, emotions being universal, and I was just um, I was just wondering if uh, if that's what you'd found from your uh, testing. So, if people from different cultures do actually experience the stories and the emotions the same way. Now, I know you said that you you can kind of design for the user experience and you can't really have an impact over that. But I was just wondering if people do from different cultures actually experience the same emotions and if that's something that you found. Well, it's a, it's a very interesting question, obviously. Um, what we have test is that uh, communicating, uh, uh, um, communicating the main elements of the project, and that's what we have done in the test, is to test this as a brochure and trying to test this in terms of efficiency, in terms of uh, if the people, and we have groups in Spain and groups in UK, uh, they have a similar welcoming, a similar reception of the experience as a whole, and if they understand elements of the uh, climate change, uh, for example, or, uh, you know, uh, circular economy and things like that in the same way. And the results are relatively similar in the sense that in both cases, it's a slightly better the use of the application than the brochure. Okay, that's what we have found. But we didn't really test in terms of emotions. Uh, I have to say that it's uh, kind of the things that when I say then later I regret, to make such an emphasis on universality of emotions. As you know, universality uh, of emotions is something that has been stated by anthropologists, and they have uh, talked about emotions in terms of uh, things that statistically tends to be recognized as similar, okay? But you can have entire thesis in the, the translation between different terminologies of emotion from English to Spanish, for example. And uh, in Spain, you can translate mood like humor, but it's not the same as humor, as you know. So mood, uh, emotion, sentiment, you know, <laughs> what exactly are we talking about? Then are we talking a, about a model of emotions that is purely psychological, where you have elements of balance, arousal, and all this, or we have elements of 
pure categorization. So it's something that it should be addressed specifically. Because as a psychologist, I'm so much respectful about all this to, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, assume that, uh, uh, you know, enjoyment is an uh, emotion and everybody is going to enjoy the experience the same way. Okay, I think uh, digital designers usually are more focused on avoided negative emotions, like for example, avoiding frustration than uh, eliciting, uh, you know, happiness in, in, the, in the tool. Yeah. So what you focus is in the people experience the, the tool uh, fluidly and working well and not being bored and enjoying playing with the, with the tool. And this is important because obviously you can do three years of a project, lots of money, and then later releasing the website, not having a good website, uh, you know, uh, technical infrastructure, and then experience that nobody is going to wait for the website to be load, and therefore nobody's going to experience your beautiful story. So what's the point? So yeah. that's why integrating digital design into different aspects of storytelling seems important to me as well. I don't yes. know if I, I, I asked your question with that. <laughs> don't know. No, that's great. No, that's really, really useful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I, I don't know. Hi there. So, sorry, sorry. I, um, I, I put in the chat, if anyone's got a question, please, you know, put in the chat, raise your hand, or just ask Manuel directly. So Stuart, do you Stuart have a question? It's <laughs> physical hand, which is something that I didn't see for a I while. Can, I, can also do it, I can also do it digitally, but... but. Oh, okay, um, sorry. <laughs> tell, tell yeah, me. Kind of, kind of, this is a question that kind of follows on from, from the question uh, that, that Claire was asking, uh, and it was it's to do with the, the notion of consequences inside the, the game. So the game that, that you were showing with one of the ecosystem services and uh, relating to, la to land management there. I was just thinking about, uh, uh, so clearly the, the, the player's actions have consequences, but I was just wondering whether, well, two things really. One is whether, uh, like one of the big criticisms about, is it about games is that you can do things that are essentially consequence free, you know, so, so all those, you know, the, the games like, um, Grand Theft Auto and so on and so forth. So people can kind of role play and they're, they're often described as being like bad actions that are consequence free. But I guess what they mean there is they don't mean a consequence in the game. They mean a kind of emotional or a real, a real world consequence. But actually from the game you're trying to produce or the game you've produced is kind of not just seeing the consequences in the game. You're also trying to get the user to emotionally engage with those consequences so they're like they're meaningful consequences for the user and I, I and just a kind of t tiny other little twist on that is that it, it occurs that you're in very powerful position as the game designer because you could of course have positive consequences which are not to do with managing the ecosystem or, or, or managing farming practices to benefit the ecosystem but you could have consequences that are um so, oh, this is the profit that the farm is making. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, the, 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 the challenge I see as well is that you have a system where there is positive and negative consequences, but in order to understand that progression, narrative progression, uh, in this case, you play the advantage of being real, real context. Okay. For good or for bad, everybody knows the consequence of the climate change because climate change is there, and because, uh, especially in my area, in my hometown, and that surroundings, that is a desert. So obviously, we can understand, you know. But it's more difficult, however, to translate concepts as biodiversity, because uh, people tend to think, especially, well, it can be maybe even, even more uh, radical for a British uh, individual, for example, because you are used to a certain weather, a certain climate and a certain ecosystem. For you, it's normal to uh, look at the window and see squirrels playing in the garden. But in, in, in Spain, the equivalent to that would be, you know, 
pigeons or rats. It's not that normal. People uh, in Spain, they have a hard time thinking that deserts are also scenarios full of ecosystems and full of, you know, value in terms of biodiversity. So you have to educate in that. And that creates a challenge because they think that unless in their game, everything is green, we are not progressing. And that it, 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 it's a problem. So I, I think that, for, for example, now that I think about that, my offer a great challenge in terms of intercultural comparison. Look, more maybe than, than the emotions, if you, if, you, if, you, if you want, you know? But yeah, kind of, we have to explain in a way or another what is the possible progression. And what we did in this game is the ability to play more than once. But uh, in other contexts, you might have interventions or you might have uh, other tools in order to explain the users why consequences are, can be positive or negative and what that, that means. So I think uh, you have to think about this as a tool so uh, it can be integrated to other tools. You know, that's how I see that. Yeah, no but again, maybe it's the psychologists that talk, <laughs> you know, now, you know. No, th thanks, thanks Amir, for that insight. Very useful. I know there's a, there's another question coming in from Sky. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know if uh, maybe it was any other question. Yeah, I do have a question. Uh, uh, how do you make a game on your situation? You are trying to study two different cultures, as you just said. So how do you make the game work with different cultures? people having different understandings about the topic as well and different stereotypes about the yeah. topic because everyone has those yeah. uh, so you know people will be more affected if they had some kind of problem already in their life related to global warming than someone yeah. that never had that experience so how do you make the game affect everyone well, i think uh, the key well, it's related to what we have said before but i think the key is understanding the user understanding the, the target audience. Again, this is kind of, a, you know, a, a very free assumption. No? You say in a digital design class, understand your target, understand your target. And every time, everybody gets that as a, such a big definition of what you have to do without judging all the implications that that direct, direct, uh, direction, that, that guideline entails. Okay, uh, they don't understand that if you, you, if you understand the target, then you cannot do this. If you understand the target, you cannot do that. So uh, you have to do a study, a clear study of who is going to use the, the tool in order to understand the background, understand the motivations, understand the way they, and that is why in uh, digital design, in usability, in all these areas where there are, um, elements of empirical testing you uh, obviously you control all these variables you don't ask uh, people of different backgrounds if you cannot control that as a variable so you uh, you for example can uh, control the familiarity of the tool uh, or you can control the use of the, the digital literacy levels of the users because you have to understand that if you are playing a game there are elements of culture in the game so if your user is a gamer you might understand the game much better with independence of him or her being British or Spanish or any other nationality because, you know, there are elements of culture that has nothing to do with the nation or the, the country or the ethnic group or the language. Culture is more than that. So how do you break stereotypes? Stereotypes uh, can be very useful in narrative conventions. Uh, if you are in the case of this game, for example, we, we needed to communicate the presence of some, uh, of some uh, characters within the game, and you have to present a character as a tourist in front of a character that is uh, a farmer. How can you communicate that if you don't have interaction with the characters? If you cannot address to the virtual character and ask the character, hey, uh, lady or gentleman, are you by any chance an eco-tourist? Well, obviously, it is the use of conventions, you know, visual conventions, 
that helps you to communicate that effectively. But uh, this is something that I work uh, with my students many times, and uh, it has to be done with uh, responsibility, with research, and also with some, uh, yeah, some kind of uh, knowledge of the implications, no? because uh, as members of the educational communities, we have responsibilities and we, we shouldn't, you know, uh, uh, create uh, or reinforce negative stereotypes, okay? But uh, visual conventions can help to communicate uh, complex ideas, so it can be used with caution. So I'm asking this because on all my games, I try to create characters that have absolutely no gender. So that's my achievement most of the time. Uh, that has no, sorry? That yes. don't have genders? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Most of the time, what that creates is every single person looks at my characters and they will assume that they are male. Well, you know, uh, there are different elements playing there, no? Uh, if you allow me the expression. Uh, you, you, you know probably as a postgraduate student there are uh, interest in literature about gender and, and games, so it is a fascinating topic. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, gender can be definitory of the person or the individual, but it's not the only way to define an individual. That you have to think is if you are interested in creating individuality and addressing individuality in the game. And if that is uh, necessary, then obviously you can use gender, you can use other mechanisms. It doesn't have to be gender, you know? In this case particular, I introduced uh, farmers, but I didn't assume that the farmer have to be uh, defined as a man or a, or a woman. We have characters that are easily identified as men and others that are easily identified as women, but both of them, uh, those tip, is, doesn't have that much diversity in the game, obviously. It's kind of simple for many reasons. Uh, they are, both characters are identified as farmers because they are working in the field. They are driving a, a tractor or they are working with the trees or they are, uh, you know, with the animals. So that is why they are identified as farmers, you know? Yeah, that, that was my analogy. So if you have a farmer, a lot of people will have stereotypes straight away about what the farmer is. And yeah, but so that can influence a lot of games, even just by choosing the type of character, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, there will be, they are experiences that are designed in that way. This one hasn't been designed this way. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, so it's little we can do at this point. I don't know if in future versions or wherever. Uh, and yeah, I mean, uh, as you know, in uh, research, you have many ways to, go to manipulate variables. One way is to control variables, other is to randomize variables. For example, you could argue that a way of uh, um, establishing no clear or direct consequences between gender and, and information, you can control that by um, uh, eliminating gender of the equation, but you can also argue that another way could be randomizing that and presenting as many different characters and genders as possible, you know, which is another way, but I don't know, it's not honestly my field of expertise. I usually work uh, more with, uh, you know, narrative design. Although it's a fascinating topic and I understand that it might have implications in my own work. It's something obviously to talk and to explore uh, in major depth. But, but yeah, when you say stereotype, I wasn't thinking particularly in gender, honestly. I was thinking in many other ways of understanding stereotyping okay yeah in your situation i was actually thinking about the farmer right mm. a lot of people think straight away that a farmer is someone that doesn't care they just want to to grow things and they don't care about global warming at all yeah so yeah. was that intended 
have you created a farmer because of that to try to break that stereotype or not? Yeah, well, but you, uh, you can be fair, but at the same time in the, in the logic of the product, you have to be careful because the people who is going to play the game are farmers. So if you, uh, for example, uh, portray attitudes or you know behaviors that are not uh, positive, you might be uh, not only being unfair or unfair, which is one question, but also literally insulting the user. So you have to be careful with that, you know. But uh, saying that, I'm thinking, and this is very out of the box. Uh, in my area, I, I have heard the stories all the time about farmers contaminating, polluting, or uh, the typical situation where a farmer finds a snake in the field and just kill the snake. Like the typical attempt against diversity, you know, biodiversity. And, and, and that's awful, you know. So should you portray that, not portray that? Are you portrayed in reality? Are you portrayed in ideal, uh, you know, behaviors? I think here we are uh, in a language that we are trying to communicate uh, abstract uh, ideas through uh, the representation of specific uh, artifacts and behaviors. And in that sense, we need to be iconic. We need to be identifiable. We need to be recognizable. But we don't have to be, you know, poetic or death or uh, you know realistic or anything like that i think that's my that's my approach hi there that was uh, that was a good question um has anyone else got a question okay. or any comments for manuel okay if it's Oh, sorry. I think we're going to wrap, wrap up there, uh, Danny. I was just going to pass on my thanks uh, uh, to Manuel for this, uh, for a really uh, fascinating talk and a really interesting insight into to game design. I, I know it's been super useful for the uh, for the heritage students, and we look forward to picking up the conversation later, Manuel. Yeah, Absolutely, and it would be great. I mean, uh, as well. I mean, if any other researcher, including the students, you want to contact in the future, I'm always. Uh, you know, up for a talk or anything like that. I mean, if our agendas, obviously, because you know, sometimes university is just crazy, you know, the teaching, the research and all this. But uh, I mean, being possible, I'm always happy. And uh, this is the second time uh, I've been participating in seminars with the steward. Uh, first time it was really, really great as well. Uh, we were commenting the cases of the students and, and seeing the different solutions that they did. And it was really, uh, very pleasant later months later to see the results of their work and uh, kind of thinking until what point I can have help with my talk you know to inspire or to find solutions to the problems which I think it was very satisfactory so uh, I, I'm really uh, uh, grateful for you to invite me to this and you know uh, any other time we can have another talk so it's not really a problem I know that sometimes this uh, virtual thing make us to be so shy. So, uh, you know, uh, maybe you need sometimes more than once. Uh, well, yeah. uh, for me, it's, it, it's fine, uh, Danny. Uh, th thank you very much and, and thank you again for allowing us to record this because what this means is that for the students that couldn't attend today then they can uh, obviously they can participate well not participate but they can enjoy your talk uh, afterwards okay so thank you very much again I'm going to stop the recording now